Have you ever bumped your head and seen stars? There was a time when athletes would play through a suspected concussion or maybe just try to shake it off. That's no longer the case with increased attention to the long-term effects of head injuries. We're not trying to replace the role of the physician, right? But we're trying to give some sort of indicator right then and there to, for the safety of, of the of the child. That's OSF Healthcare pediatrician Dr. Adam Cross discussing the new app they're developing at the Children's Innovation Lab. And I'm Shelley Dankoff, your host of Health Accelerated, brought to you by OSF Healthcare. Today we take a look at Flight Path and how it looks to change the way we diagnose head injuries, all in an effort to treat them earlier. Our guest today is Dr. Adam Cross. He is the director of the Children's Innovation Lab at OSF Healthcare Jump Trading Simulation and Education Center. He is also an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics for the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Peoria. Dr. Cross, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, Shirley. Nice to be here. Let's start kind of at the beginning with you. What led you into the path to becoming a pediatric hospitalist and wanting to go into this as a career set? Well, I've always been interested in taking care of children. I think that there's such a need for this population. You know, small things can, if left untreated, can cause long-term issues for our whole lives. And on the other side, if you if you take care of these patients appropriately when they're young, you can set an example for the rest of their life. So to me, it's it's, a, it's such an imp- important part of our, our lives to really make sure that we give the right kind of care. And for me, I enjoy being a hospitalist because I really enjoy taking care of, of sick children. And I like being the one who coordinates all of their care in the hospital, the one who puts together all of the subspecialists, the pediatric cardiologists, the neurologist, all of the people as, as the whole medical team. You know, I'm sort of the focal point for the way that these children get better in the hospital. And to me, that's such a rewarding position. In a way, describing a hospitalist, you sound like a Tetris game. You know, you have the pieces and parts and you have to work them all together depending on what the child is dealing with, correct? Yes, very much so. And I'm also usually the problem solver. I'm at the point where when kids get sick and sick enough to get in the hospital and no one knows what's going on, I'm the one who's tasked with figuring out what's going on. I, I like that the problem-solving part of my work very much. So that probably leads you a little bit to this Children's Innovation Lab. This just sounds fascinating as a whole. You know, the Jump Simulation Center in Peoria, Illinois, it's a world-class simulation center. We do a little bit of everything here, a lot of problem-solving, a lot of, you know, hands-on training. And the Children's Innovation Lab, tell me a little bit about that and what the goal is for it. Sure. The goal of the Children's Innovation Lab is to improve how clinicians make decisions at the point of care, meaning in the moment when they're making their decisions throughout their day, how do we give them the correct resources, the correct information, the correct tools to be the best doctors they can be? And that manifests in a lot of different ways. We do some work with uh, machine learning. We do work with creation of actual biomedical engineering devices. And some of it is just is also education, but anything we can do to improve how we make our decisions, that's the goal of the, of the lab. And we're going to talk a little bit about the app that you are working on developing through the Children's Innovation Lab, but it all comes about concussions. Tell me what drew you to this topic and why the focus on concussions. Traumatic brain injury is the most common cause of long-standing injury in children. It's the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in children worldwide. It's actually the most common cause of everybody under the age of 42. So it's a huge, huge issue um, in this country and abroad. And the amazing part about it is for mild TBI, so concussions, we don't have any standardized testing that we can do that's objective. So there's there's no CT scan finding, no MRI finding, no lab test you can do for concussion. And that leaves us with some pretty outdated subjective tests. So basically just how do you think the person looks? What symptoms do they report? And that works well enough when the person who's talking to you is honest. But as we all know, especially in the area of of sports, these players don't always want to disclose when they're not feeling well because they want to play. If you look at the published data, you know, the, the reporting rate of concussion is about four to five percent of athletes in the adolescent population. But if you look at the data around anonymous reporting, 
So when they allowed these players to just report for publication but not actually to coaches, it was upwards of 15 to 45%, so up to 10 times wow. that, that rate. So the number of concussions that are going unnoticed and unreported is probably astronomical, and we need a better tool to identify these patients. Do you think there's been increased attention on it? Because even the NFL, even the pros have been doing it a long time, and there's been a lot of attention to CTE and players who have died and their brains have been donated to science, and they determined, yeah, you had some really bad stuff going on, and they determined it's from all the years of taking a hit to the head. Even this season, you know, the NFL, during their preseason workouts and early training camp, they had the players wear soft helmets. They put a big puffy covering, if you will, on top of their helmets to lessen the blows and reduce the amount of contact, because I think people don't realize... How even if something as simple as banging your head on like your car door, if you're getting groceries out of it, can cause a mild TBI, can it? It can. And it's it's amazing how something that can seem so small can cause long term issues. And the reverse is certainly true right there. Some people who get big hits and have no long standing symptoms, but those things don't always correlate. Sometimes a concussion, even a even a mild TBI, if it's repetitive or if it's if it's the hit the wrong way can cause long-standing issues. And we're still trying to figure out how to predict when and how those symptoms manifest. You know, there's a lot of focus that is placed on football because that's what people think of. But really, that's not even the sport, I think, with the most uh, head injuries, is it? I think the research shows things like soccer and other sports like that are just as problematic where people may not even give it a second thought. Men's American football and women's soccer are, I believe, still the, the one and two. But uh, lacrosse, v- basketball, volleyball, all of these have significant incidences of concussion. Yeah, because people just don't even think about it. I recall being in high school. I got a concussion in gym class because they thought it was a great idea for everybody to run to a bucket of balls in the center of the room in the court, grab them, and then we played dodgeball. What do you think is going to happen when kids run at each other with their heads and don't even give it a second thought? And Mm -hmm. you just kind of smack heads on the playground even. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's not unusual. Can a concussion cause permanent damage? And and do the ages make a difference? Are we seeing a more proliferation in older kids? Is there a specific age group we look at? Or is it all over the place? So concussions are important to note in all age groups. Um, Certainly, very young is is very concerning, but all age groups are important. Now, usually, usually, a mild TBI, which is what a concussion is classified as, a mild TBI, does not cause permanent damage, usually. Things like moderate and severe TBI certainly can cause long-term disability, but that's just, that's just the usual. However, there are people who have months and even years sometimes of long-standing symptoms from a mild TBI, whereas others will get better in a matter of days. So is there something, and again, we're going to get to the app that you have developed to help diagnose this, but when we think about it, are there things that maybe parents can educate their kids on about head injuries and being proactive and perhaps not getting one even to begin with? Well, I do want to I do want to note that sports concussions are only one piece of the puzzle, right? Bicycle injuries, motor vehicle collisions, there are so many other causes of, of TBI. So... I will, I will say the same thing that you've heard since you were a kid. Wear your helmet. It is the most important thing you can do is convince your child to wear a helmet whenever they're in any vehicle or they're riding their bicycle. That is the single best thing you can do. But when it comes to sports, I would teach them to, if they're not feeling right, to tell someone, tell a grown-up what's going on. If they're an, if they're an adolescent athlete, like it's not worth potentially jeopardizing the rest of their career or the season to play the rest of this game or this practice. You know, you've got to take care of yourself now to uh, to make sure that you maximize your ability to continue to perform well in the future. The single greatest risk factor for prolonged time to recovery and concussion is delayed diagnosis and management. So if we don't know that something's wrong and you just go back into what you were doing full force, that's that's very likely to make make it take longer for you to get better. What is like the post-concussion typical protocol to help somebody get over it? What what do you do? All I remember from when I had mine was 
they didn't want me to go to sleep, but yet I needed to rest. Now, again, this was a very long time ago. And so I'm, I'm guessing things have changed a little bit. But what is a typical recovery protocol for somebody who has suffered even a minor TBI? So it, it depends on the person, but in general, a, a gradual return to play and a gradual return to full academics is sometimes necessary. So if it depends on their symptoms, right? But if they're having confusion, headache, visual disturbances, um, emotional changes, all these can, can be common post-concussion. You need, you need to do just enough to keep your, keep your mind and your body active, but not so much that you're starting to make your symptoms worse. And that's best done, that plan is best made in conjunction with a concussion specialist, like some of the ones we have here at OSF. Yeah, you definitely need to see a physician and a caregiver because that confusion, you know, don't just chalk it up to your child as, okay, they're just being a kid, but confusion is a real big situation that you need to be aware of, isn't it? Yeah, and those are the symptoms that usually go missed. You know, if someone passes out after getting hit or if they're vomiting, I think most people understand that's a bad sign, but irritability or, you know, fatigue, being more tired, those are things that can be more easily missed. So let's switch gears and talk directly about the application that you have developed. It's called Flight Path. Tell me about that. So Flight Path is an attempt to diagnose concussion more objectively, meaning with more more quantified metrics and numbers than some of our previous tests. And it can be done with just a smartphone, and it can actually be performed by the person who's maybe concussed rather than needing someone who's trained to perform it on the person. Again, it's an app. It can be on a phone. It can be on an iPad or whatever, Android or Apple devices. So walk me through what takes place. Yeah, so it's an augmented reality application. So I usually give the example of Pokemon Go. People have seen that. You have your camera. You can see the whole world. And then there's a virtual object that's in, that's placed in that camera view, right? So we put a hummingbird in that camera view. And the hummingbird flies around the room. And it's your job to catch it. And to catch it, you actually have to move not just side and side, but you have to walk forward, backward around the room. And the application knows it's scanning your room constantly. So it knows the contours of the walls and the furniture. So the bird can have free reign to fly in that space. And the way that it flies is actually programmed. It's automated and it's, it's randomized. But it flies in such a way that's different every time, but it's doing things very intentionally to assess how good you are at making these turns or these movements uh, and, and capturing it. And the way in which you do better or worse with different kinds of motions and capturing it, we can start to figure out what kinds of, uh, of potential impairments you have from the concussion. So on the back end of this application, there's this, there's this AI, this, this machine learning model that we've developed, and it's always looking at how well you're performing at any given second, actually multiple times a second, um, 60 times a second it's looking at this. And every time it will adapt how the bird is flying based on how well you're doing, and any time that it notes potentially some, some problems, it, rec it records that too. And in the end, we make this, this 3D model basically for physicians to look at that's got a bunch of labels on it from the model and it tells the physician, here are the places where the person really didn't perform as well as we would expect for their age or their, their prior attempts at this. And based on, on these different components, here's their potential risk for concussion. So you don't have to do anything like a baseline on this or anything. It can be you show up, you suspect a child is having an issue, run them through their paces, right? Right, right. And it can be done on, right now, any any of the newer iPhones or iPads. So you don't have to have any special devices with you. As long as you have a newer generation iPhone or iPad, you just pull it out and download the app, and then you can assess for concussion. So you could potentially do this on the sideline of a game, couldn't you? Yeah, that's the, that's the goal of it, yeah. So you're standing right there, somebody notices, because you're right, Kids, especially boys, will be like, no, I'm fine. Put me back in, coach. But if you took them in, like in the NFL, they have to take them into the blue tent to assess them for injuries. So if you did this on a sideline for a young person, you should be able to tell pretty quickly. Does it show up right away where they assess? Or do you have to have 
you know, you talk about that physician looking at it. Does it give you an indication right away whether they're good, bad, or, you know, on the borderline? So we're not trying to replace the role of the physician, right? But we're trying to give some sort of indicator right then and there for the safety of, of the of the child. So it will give you at that time, what are the different kinds of things that we're noticing? Are we noticing dizziness or are we noticing delayed reaction time? And then we'll say, based on how prevalent these different pieces are and how severe they are, what their overall risk is of concussion. Now, if their risk of concussion is high, we would hope that they'd be pulled and then they would see a physician. You put me through my paces with flight paths. You let <laughs> me test the app. That's not easy. That, first of all, feels like the longest two minutes I've ever gone through. But that bird is moving all over the place. Is this what you're finding in the early testing of the app? Yeah, it's it's a challenge, but it's a challenge because we have to put you to the limit of what you can do to really understand how you're performing. Because if you're doing 100% the whole time, and then if you have a concussion, maybe you're still 100% because we don't know what it took to get you less than 100%. So we start out very challenging. And then the bird adapts to your performance and... As you, if you if you start to struggle, then it starts to get a little bit simpler. Go ahead, you can say it. I started to struggle because I even said to Doctor Cross, I said, "The bird's slowing down. I feel like I'm doing better." And he's like, "Yeah, it adapts to your performance, which means I wasn't reacting as quickly." And I was amazed how much it moved, and I felt like I was all over the place. If I actually had a concussion or even a bad headache, I feel like. I would have gotten sick, and it would be very obvious that somebody is struggling. This, this to me, may, would make it very obvious. Yeah, and not just objectively, but you know, we're actually we're doing these precise measurements of your position and and the position of the of the sphere you're using to capture the bird at at a rate of sixty times a second. So it becomes very quickly apparent to the application when you're not performing the way that it expects you to. Now, nobody is expected to be perfect with the, the difficulty of the bird. And so everyone's going to struggle with it. But that doesn't, that actually makes it easier for us to figure out when you have a concussion because we can understand the ways in which a normal person can struggle and the way that a concussed person struggles. So, for example, if the bird flies past your head, right, we're all going to lose the bird for a moment. That's right. just how it goes because it's no longer on the screen. But there's an arrow that shows you which way to go. Now, a person who is not concussed sees that arrow and can quickly plan their body movement to figure out exactly where to go to find that bird. And then when they find it, they're able to you know, move forward and move back to get on the right depth for that bird. But a concussed person, that process is really complicated to do. And those, those steps don't just happen as inherently for someone who's concussed. So the way in which they take those individual steps to find that bird and then the way that they realign themselves with that bird, there are very prominent motions and and changes that may be subtle when we look at them, but are very obvious from the data. Obviously you were in, a, in the test mode and you were getting the early data back. What did you think when you saw it? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you maybe too? It's definitely harder than I thought it would. And I'm somebody who does work in the AR space, but trying to capture this bird, we don't make it easy on you, which is intentional. Many of the athletes that we are are gearing this application for are very capable of the fast reaction times and they're native to the smartphone generation. So we have to make this challenging, but we also have to adapt it to the level of the individual. So getting that adaptive process, right, where, where we make it hard, but not too hard, but we find the right level of difficulty to best test them in that two-minute window, that was particularly challenging. Walk me through the testing process on, on what you have done with the app so far and where we're at with it. Well, we spent the last several months building the application through its alpha and beta and stable releases, and we've done some internal testing with myself, my team, some volunteer physicians and college students, and gotten it to the point where we're ready to start our clinical trials, which will happen this fall. And how does that typically work? There is a very regimented process, if you will, to go through clinical trials. Walk me through what takes place there. So we're actually doing things in a, in a brand new way this time around, and I'm really excited about it. So this time, we are going to have people, of course, that we enroll here at OSF through the ED and also through the concussion clinic. But in terms of our our control population, so the healthy individuals, 
we're actually going to open this up on the App Store so that people pretty much anywhere can just put in their age, set up a free free account with no identifying information, and and just play the game. And we get the anonymous data to really build our control population. So it's beneficial to us because we can get a lot more data that way. And it benefits our users because they can have a really easy access to the app. They don't have to go through this long enrollment method. Now, for those who are concussed, of course, it'll be much more like the traditional enrollment process where we have research coordinators and physicians who are consenting them, explaining the whole process, performing the studies with them here. But for everyone else, it's just a matter of downloading the app and playing it. For the concussed individuals who come through, who go through the protocol to be followed through the clinical trial, how often would you retest to check them? Or is there a specific protocol or is it just a matter of depending on how they feel and and how they're progressing that you would check them? That's a great question. So for the first model that we're making, the machine learning model, the AI in the background, we actually aren't going to include any return individuals. We want all of it to be either they're healthy or they're pretty much right after they got injured. So we can get a really good sense of what's normal and what's really abnormal. Now, the, as we build this model, as it gets better and better at identifying this stuff, then we'll start to look at how people recover. But the recovery process is challenging because it requires us to really see those nuances. Of, are they are they a little bit still impaired? You know, do they have a little bit of dizziness or are they normal? And that level of identification you can only get once you're when you're really sure when the model's really sure of what really abnormal looks like and what normal looks like. So that's why you will probably work very closely with the physicians going along to help understand what is going on with these individuals. I imagine there will be a close relationship there to help improve this product moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a partnership with the INI here, the concussion clinic at INI, and we'll be working with them in future stages to better assess how these patients recover. Have you been excited watching this process develop? I mean, it's it's taken place over the course of most of this year. So it must be exciting watching it get ready to launch and do that. You know, it's kind of like that kid at Christmas waiting to unwrap the present and see how it really works. Are you kind of feeling a little bit of that? Oh, very much. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see, especially in the medical community, there are so many skeptics in terms of, you know, how... How could a how could a, a an iPhone app or a video game have a role in medicine? But the thing is, our our phones and our tablets are such sophisticated devices, and compared to pen and paper tests that we've done in the past, this is this is light years ahead of where we used to be. So, seeing seeing all these physicians who were doubters now become believers as they as they test the app and watch it in, in, in motion, that's been really rewarding to me. And I can't wait to see how, how much of a difference this makes after we finish our clinical trials. Yeah, you're a younger physician. So yeah, educating the older physicians has to be a little bit interesting. Was it fun kind of watching them do it and perhaps <laughs> not be as successful as they thought they would be? Oh, I don't want to pick on them. We're, we're all, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I was, I was born in, in this tech generation and they weren't. But uh, I'm 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 really impressed by how willing many of my colleagues have been to to test this out and accept the information and how eager they are to use it in their day to day clinical work. I bet it was a little eye opening to them too. Yeah, it, it it really has been. We've had a lot of fun trying to make the bird fail too. We do a lot of a lot of work to really debug everything, and we've you know, held up rounded mirrors and you know, tested it in glass boxes and try all the ways we could think of to make to make the flight fail because we want this to work in every situation, right? And that's been a lot of fun too. Yeah, because you learn through failure. People don't always think that, but it's very accurate. You learn through failure and move on from that. So it's kind of exciting. Anything else I haven't asked you about on this app that people should be aware? I mean, hopefully there'll be lots of excitement and that you might be working down the road with coaches and making them aware, just increasing the awareness. Will be that will there be that type of uh, information going out to say, go check this out, go on your phones, try this now, because it, it's going to be out there and available. Yeah, definitely. When it's when it's out there and it's available, we're going to have a big outreach program. Now, we're going to need to do a lot of initial studies to make sure that this works and this works well. You know, we're not going to throw anything half-baked in, into these situations because we want 
to ensure the safety of our players. But when it's ready, and only when it's ready, we'll definitely be getting the word out to all of our you know, regional schools and teams, and we already have a great communication with, with all those individuals. So when it comes, it will definitely come in a big wave. If all goes well in getting it to that point, when do you anticipate it'll have that broader launch? Is there a time frame? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> and I, I have to say that sometimes medical devices, they can go fast and they can go slow. And all this, there's all this regulation around how to do it. So I'd like to be, I like to be hopeful and say sometime by next year. But this is, I think, our first time creating such a such um, an impactful and wide-reaching application, we really want to take the time we need to get it right. Well, and it's such an important topic, again, that concussions have gotten so much attention. And if you can help stop them early in a person's life, even if they go on to have a professional sports career, that's a game changer. And that's some of the work we're doing at the Jump Trading Simulation and Education Center in Peoria. Dr. Adam Cross, thank you for being with us today and explaining. It sounds very exciting. Look forward to seeing it being out there in wider use. Of course. Thank you very much. Remember, the name is Flight Path. Keep an eye out for it, hopefully in early 2023. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Health Accelerated, brought to you by OSF Healthcare. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find links to any of our episodes on the OSF Newsroom at newsroom.osfhealthcare.org.